you serve? The Cold War. Uh, what was your branch of service? The U.S. Navy. And your highest rank? The dispersing clerk, petty officer, second class. Okay. Uh, what were some of the general locations that you served? Well, I served aboard two ships, one for a short period of a couple months and uh, one for about two plus years. Uh, we were home ported, both ships were home ported in Little Creek, Virginia, which is the uh, Navy amphibious base uh, on the East Coast, the Sixth Fleet. Uh, we uh, uh, moved from uh, all over the East Coast, uh, places like Argentia, Newfoundland, Halifax, Nova Scotia, uh, various uh, places in uh, North and South Carolina to pick up Marines to take them on amphibious landing exercises. Uh, went to Vegas, Puerto Rico. Uh, Panama, saw the Panama Canal. We went to Maracaibo, Venezuela, where we were the, f the first uh, American warship to uh, visit since World War II. And uh, then we spent six months in the northern Mediterranean from Gibraltar to Izmir, Turkey, and uh, various places in between. Okay. Um, what made you choose uh, to enlist in the Navy? Well, my brother served in the Navy uh, during the Korean conflict from 1948 to 52. And uh, I had always felt a kinship to the Navy. Um, right after graduating from high school, uh, my parents were uh, pretty insistent that I go to college, so I went to UConn for a year, and I really didn't want to be there. Uh, I didn't feel any sense of purpose or direction as to why I was there, and uh, I took an engineering course. I took up time and space. Uh, I was in uh, Air Force ROTC for one year while I was there. And uh, at the end of my first year, I decided uh, I needed more time to find myself. And uh, uh, I w uh, went to the Air Force recruiter in Hartford and asked if they could guarantee me a school. And they said they don't guarantee anybody anything. So uh, my... Uh, uh, I had taken the exam for the uh, Air Force Academy, which was just getting off the ground. And I was appointed by uh, then Congressman Tom Dodd uh, for the uh, inaugural class as a candidate for the inaugural class of the Air Force Academy. And I thought that might carry some weight, which it didn't. Uh, they were only taking people who uh, qualified as uh, fighter pilots uh, upon graduation. When uh, I took my physical uh, for the, for the uh, air for the air academy, uh, uh, they found a small scar in my left ear from uh, uh, some problem I had when I was four years old, and they said, "Well, it may never be a problem, but we can't take a chance." So uh, they, uh, they didn't have supply schools or engineering schools or anything like that. So uh, I went next door to the uh, Navy recruiter, and I asked if they could guarantee me a school, and they said, oh, sure. So I said, works for me, and uh, I joined the Navy, and uh, I enlisted at Hartford, but I was sworn in at Springfield, and uh, the rest is history. Um, do you remember the date that you enlisted? It, uh, August 17th, 
1955. Can we go back and talk about your Air Force ROTC? What sure. Did, what did you do um, in that? Went to class, I think it was once a week, how to wear a uniform. And uh, uh, there was nothing special about it. We didn't have any summer camp or any training because it was just during my first year. And uh, that's when they give you all the basics in the classroom. But uh, uh, never had any special training in the Air Force. Okay. Um, can you tell me about some of your first days in the Navy? <laughs> Been trying to forget for a long time. <laughs> yeah, that was uh, my first experience riding a school bus. Okay. Uh, they took us from the. Uh, I had uh, boot camp at Bainbridge, Maryland. And uh, there was a railroad station at a town called Perryville, Maryland. Uh, that uh, they provided uh, transportation from Perryville Railroad Station to the uh, uh, Navy base at the boot camp. And uh, I rode a school bus. That was a kidney buster. That that was not. A, coach like they have today but uh, it was uh, it was a waker upper uh, with the uh, the regimentation that we had to go through and uh, the way uh, they trained us we had a lot of classroom work there was a lot of physical uh, uh, activity uh, it was PT we used to call it physical torture but uh, there was a lot of uh, physical activity, which I, I wasn't used to. When I, when I was, uh, went to sign up at the, uh, the draft board, uh, when I turned 18, uh, it was, uh, they told me I weighed 123 pounds. And when I came home from boot camp, which I think it was eight weeks later, uh, I weighed about 134, okay. which I haven't seen since. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about the training that you went through? Well, a lot of it was uh, learning about uh, customs and uh, the proper way to salute and how to stencil all your clothes with your name on it so nobody else would steal it. Uh, the uh, they they taught us gunnery. Exer uh, we had exercises in uh, how to uh, fire uh, anti-aircraft weapons, and it, a lot. It was all dummy stuff, but uh, there there was a lot of a lot of classroom work. Uh, I have a manual here which I still have on the uh, boot camp uh, manual of. Uh, procedures and what the insignias mean and how to tie knots, which I wasn't very good at in Boy Scouts either, but that's a, that's all right. But a lot of, it, it was seamanship and uh, how to call a wall a bulkhead and a floor as a deck. And it was a whole different language. And the proper way to wear your uniform and salute. Do you remember any of your instructors? The uh, company commander was a fellow named Baloo. I don't remember his first name. I don't think we ever knew it. <laughs> Just called him a Baloo. <laughs> that was it. But uh, he was a career Navy enlisted man. I don't remember what his rate was. Um, how did you get through a boot camp? How did you survive it? <laughs> you just make up your mind that you're, you're n not going to not survive it. You just do it. And there were a lot of people who were in the same position that I was in who... Uh, 
supported each other. We all had each other's backs. And we all came from different places. There were people from the Ozarks who never wore shoes. Uh, there were people who couldn't uh, read and write. And uh, some people had college uh, degrees and some pe people didn't. One fellow I remember, uh, I th think his name was Bob Lash. Uh, he told everybody that he had played football for Notre Dame. And uh, he was like a year shy of graduation. But I, I, re I do remember him. Uh, there was a fellow named Bob Baker who came from, uh, I think it was Windsor Locks or Ellington, and uh, saw his obituary in the paper a couple of years ago, and I went to his wake, and I brought our yearbook. He was one number away from mine when we enlisted, That's his service number, and uh, uh, his family got really emotional about that because I remembered him at all. And uh, I had a picture of him when he was 17 years old. He was fresh out of high school. Um, after boot camp, where did you go to? I went to what we called A school in Newport, Rhode Island. And that was service school. So they taught us how to do what we were going to be doing for the next four years. And it was a dispersing school. And I learned how to be a payroll clerk. Um, what did that, what was that job like? Oh, everybody liked me. <laughs> I paid them. Yeah. The, uh, uh, the work involved uh, maintaining payroll records and uh, paying allowance uh, aspects of their, uh, how much they were going to get. Uh, put uh, putting their uh, their anniversaries on on the pay cards so that uh, uh, every two years they'd get their uh, pay bump and uh, uh, it was just maintaining the pay records and making sure that uh, they were accurate and we were audited all the time. The, uh, uh, some of the fellows had uh, allowances uh, on, on their pay, uh, which were deducted because they were married, and they had uh, certain allowances sent home to their spouses, and uh, uh, we had clothing allowances that had to be calculated into their pay, and pay allowances which was extra pay that we got for uh, being stationed aboard ship. Okay. Um, how long did you, were you in this position? Well, I was in that position uh, from graduation until the time I got out. Okay. Uh, so then after A school, where did you go? I was assigned to the USS Birdo, okay. which was a high-speed transport. It was a converted destroyer escort. And I was aboard that ship for, I think it was about four months. And I hurt my back while I was uh, in the storeroom. Transferred to the Navy Hospital in Portsmouth, Virginia. Spent about two months there. And... Uh, was transferred back to uh, the Navy base at Little Creek, where we worked out of an office. We lived in a dormitory, worked in an office. It was just like a civilian job, going to work every day. And uh, we stood watches every other weekend. The, uh, uh, the time came when they decided to put... Uh, there were six of us in the office who did the same thing I did, and we were all 
promote at the same time. The uh, there were th there were six LSTs in the group that I was on. We were on the staff of the uh, commander of LST Squadron Four. Uh, the uh, order came through that one of us would be assigned to each of the six LSTs. And uh, when that took place, that became my home for the rest of the time I was in the service. And uh, what was that second ship that you went to? That was the USS Waldo County okay. LST 1163. <clears throat> um, while you were on your first ship, where did that, where did you go? No place. No place. No, they they did some local exercises out of Little Creek, and I remember we spent one Armed Forces Day up in uh, Westchester County, New York. It was just for show, and uh, that was uh, there was no combat or any military uh, action that was involved in that. We just took a trip up there so we could be there for people to visit. That's all we did. And your second ship, um, where, did, where did you travel to? Well, we went from, not necessarily in any particular order, but we were in Argentia, Newfoundland. There's a, a Navy base up there, an air base. Uh, we were in Halifax, Nova Scotia. We traveled to Viegas, Puerto Rico. We did landing exercises there. Uh, we made a side trip to Panama, the Panama Canal. Uh, Maracaibo, Venezuela. We spent six months in the northern Mediterranean, and we went through Gibraltar. On the far end of the Mediterranean, uh, we were in Izmir, Turkey, for a short visit. We were in Crete, Rhodes, Sicily, Sardinia, uh, the Tyrrhenian Sea. Uh, Italy, Spain, Greece, and uh, it was just places to go. We, we stood watches on the ship while we were underway. The, uh, uh, there was no combat. We did do target practice, and uh, the guns were loud. And when we took target practice at uh, planes flying by with banners behind them, they were targets. Uh, they were very careful to tell us, be sure and hit the target, not the plane. Yes. <laughs> uh, it was an interesting time. It was during the Cold War. Everybody was nervous about somebody making a mistake politically, and we weren't able to say anything expressing our opinions about any of that stuff. We just did what we were told, went where we had to go, and just did our jobs. Okay. Uh, what was landing practice like? What did you, what did that involve? Well, we had uh, battle stations, and uh, we had to man the battle stations. Uh, when the ships landed, uh, the LSTs were, they were flat bottom boats, and we always said they were built for a one-way trip. It was not a comfort. It, it wasn't a floating hotel like some of them are now, I think. <laughs> Better be careful. But the, uh, the ships had flat bottoms. We would go right up on the beach and open the bow doors, like in the movies. You've, I'm sure you've seen them. 
and the ramp would come down and we would unload jeeps and tanks and troops. Uh, sometimes the troops would go over the side on cargo nets and the uh, uh, it was just like watching it in the movies only you weren't getting shot at. Um, what was your battle station? They were, I had several. Uh, I can't remember specifically which ones they were, but we wore headsets with radios and uh, we had to report in how many people were at that station and uh, who we were and report to the uh, officer of the deck who uh, kept track of who was where and that every station was manned. Uh, underway, uh, I remember standing watches uh, near the uh, bow of the ship and near the bridge to uh, uh, look out for possible submarines or other, other ships that might be in the way or debris that might endanger the ship. And we'd have to report back and forth that way. But uh, it was, you know, looking back, it was pretty easy stuff. Okay. Um, how was it living on the ship? Very, very close. The food was good. Okay. I have no complaints about the food at all. The uh, uh, <coughs> living conditions were tight. Uh, we had four racks, which were our mattresses, on frames that were maybe this far apart. And uh, we, we got along fine as far as who slept where. Uh, you slept in the same one all the time. And uh, we had our mattress covers and pillow covers and the laundry got done by the ship service laundry people. Uh, I was in the division that had the cooks and uh, the barbers, the laundrymen, the uh, sick bay who was in our group. And uh, most of the time we got along fine. Uh, just like any place, you know, people got antsy because they lived in very tight quarters, very close to each other. Sometimes you got under each other's skin. But most of the time we resolved that and got along okay. Um, how many people were on your ship? At the time I was on, I think there were probably about 350. Uh, what would a typical day be like from when you woke up to when you went to bed? We'd get up at the time we had to be up. Uh, we'd get cleaned up, have breakfast. We would uh, muster so that uh, we could be counted. They knew they didn't lose anybody overboard during the night. Uh, went to work. I worked in an office. And uh, I worked next to... My desk was next to the uh, ship supply officer. Behind me was a storekeeper. And uh, he had another storekeeper working with him next to him and as I recall there were four of us in that one section below deck okay. so uh, uh, we were uh, we were in, in uh, segregated according to what kind of work we did and uh, nothing special about it, it was just we went to work, and then when our work day was over, 
we went on watch or uh, we went watch a movie. If we were in port, it was a little bit different. But most of the time, uh, we just, if we were at sea, we, ju we just did our jobs and uh, went about our business. And on our free time, we could wander around the ship or read a book or watch a movie. It was nothing special. Um, did you ever get off in port and explore the towns? Oh, yeah. Yeah, we had a lot of opportunity to do that. Uh, which ones did you go see? Oh, all of them. Okay. <laughs> Every place we were. I, I tried to be sure that I would get to see the place. If I didn't spend much time there, I wanted to at least get my feet on, on the ground and uh, walk around and see what, what the place looked like and maybe meet some of the people who live there and see how they live. How was it interacting with the locals? Uh, there was one incident where we were in uh, Maracaibo, Venezuela. Uh, we had a tour guide that took us on a bus ride through town, and he showed us one of the highlights of their city, which was a Sears department store. That was their big thing. And uh, we went into the store and did a little bit of shopping. I bought a couple of gifts for my parents. And uh, uh, the fellows I was with got talking to one of the sales girls, and uh, we asked her out. And did she have any friends? So. She didn't want to do that, which was okay. But she said that they were having a party at her home that night. And this is safe because my wife knows about it. I've told her. But uh, they had, the family had an engagement party for her sister in their home. So we met her when she got out of work, and we took a cab to her house. They had one 40-watt light bulb hanging from the ceiling, a dirt floor. You could see the stars through the roof. There was, there was no conventional roof. It looked like a grape arbor that they were living in. And we got greeted with... Uh, the usual welcome, our house is your house. And big crowd. Everybody from the neighborhood brought food and there was uh, music on a record player. They, uh, they were not wealthy by any stretch. And I never forgot how welcome they made us feel. Uh, I had one year of Spanish in high school. That didn't help me much. But it was nice to be able to spend the evening with those people. And they made us feel so special. I think there were th three of us from the ship. And I wish I remembered their names. I don't even know who they were at this point. It's a long time ago. But uh, they, they did make us feel like we were part of the family, and they couldn't offer us enough to eat, what little they had. It was a dirt floor. They were as poor as you can imagine, and so welcoming that we hated to leave. Yeah. It was a wonderful experience. Okay. Um, did you go on leave anywhere? When I went on leave, it was, I went home. Okay. I just came back to Hartford. Okay. I, I didn't go on leave and travel any place that I didn't know anybody. Right. Did you see any uh, USO shows? No. Okay. Um, were you awarded any medals or citations? 
Uh, e, I got the uh, Navy Good Conduct Medal and the Navy E. Uh, what is the Navy E? That's the uh, Combat Readiness Medal. And uh, we went through exercises to qualify for it as a crew. And if we scored high enough, the ship was awarded the, uh, the medal. In those days, they gave us a little letter E to sew on our shoulder, on our uniform. And uh, we had to wear it for a year until we qualified for it again. Uh, today, they award a medal for it. Uh, not a ribbon, but a medal. Or the other way around. It, it wasn't a, a, a long medal. It was just the, the ribbon with the E on it. And uh, uh, now that's what they do. And uh, it used to be that they uh, would have... Uh, You'd, you'd have to remove it if you didn't qualify for it, if your ship didn't qualify for it again. Uh, today, I understand the rules changed, and uh, if you win it once, uh, you wear it forever. Okay. Uh, what were the exercises like to qualify for it? What did you have to do? Just combat readiness, being able to hit targets, and... Uh, I, I don't remember specifically what we had to do, but it was just knowing how to fight and defend our ship uh, from, you know, all the things that we learned in boot camp and uh, during our practices, uh, during practice landings and that sort of thing. How did you stay in touch with your family? Letters and phone. Okay. Did you have um, free access to the phone in the office, or were there certain times that you use it? No, we couldn't. We couldn't make outside calls from the ship. Okay. There was a phone booth on the end of the pier. It was a pay phone, and uh, you must have heard of them. <laughs> no, that that's what we had. Or we would write letters. Okay. Uh, did you always have enough supplies? To do our job or Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah, we never ran out of anything. Okay. Uh, did you ever feel any pressure or stress? Oh, yeah. How did you handle it? You just internalize it. You deal with it. Everybody dealt with it the same, pretty much the same way. Uh, I didn't drink, so I didn't leave the ship and go off and get drunk. There were some people who did that. And that's how they dealt with it. Um, was there anything that you kept on you for good luck or did anything for good luck? Or? No, nothing special. Um, how did people entertain themselves in their free time? Oh, well, they'd read or they'd go ashore and uh, go to a movie or what have you. Uh, they, uh, while I was stationed in Little Creek, I was fortunate that I had family in Norfolk. So on the weekends that I had off, I used to spend uh, at their home. They were pretty well off. Okay. And uh, uh, I had my own room. It was a large house in a lovely neighborhood. And... Uh, it was like being home. Nice. It was nice to have family nearby. And if I had any problems on my mind, I could talk to my aunt and uncle about it. Uh, my uncle was my father's kid brother. And we got along well. Okay. That's good.
Do you recall any uh, humorous events? Not in particular. Okay. Um, did you pull pranks on each other? I never did. I don't know if the other fellas did. Okay. Um, that was just my personality. Right. Uh, what did you think of the officers and your fellow servicemen? Some were fine. There were some that I thought shouldn't have been there. We can let that go. Okay. <laughs> But uh, I, I thought some of the officers shouldn't have been allowed to wear the uniform. I remember one incident when we were uh, going out to uh, fire uh, our guns to target practice in uh, Chesapeake Bay. We were... Uh, uh, we had ammunition on deck, and we were headed directly amidships uh, to an oil tanker, which was low in the water. So we knew they were loaded. And uh, I was on watch on the bridge when uh, the, uh, the officer on duty who was a young officer, uh, ordered the uh, helmsman, who was a young seaman, to uh, uh, stay on course. And the seaman kept asking him, uh, are you sure you don't want to change course? And he kept saying, no, I don't. And uh, uh, the helmsman asked him a, a couple of times because we were getting closer. And finally, he disregarded the order and he changed course or we could have both been on the bottom of Chesapeake Bay with everybody on board. And... Uh, the uh, commanding officer had his cabin directly below the bridge. The uh, officer put the helmsman on report for direct disobedience to a lawful order. And he had to be disciplined because he disobeyed an order. On the other hand, the uh, commanding officer called the, uh, the, the officer on watch on the bridge to uh, his cabin and chewed him out and let him know. Uh, and I got this from somebody who was standing outside the door that uh, uh, that uh, the captain didn't ever want to hear that that officer ever set foot on the bridge for the rest of the time he was commanding officer. But they treated officers differently than enlisted people. And uh, I don't know if you'd call that stressful or humorous or what, but uh, that's, that's the only time that happened that I remember. Okay. Uh, did you keep a journal or anything? No. Okay. Um, where were you when your service ended? I was in Little Creek, Virginia. And we were at the pier. And my time was up. Uh, I was given early release by about two months. Because they, at that time, the Navy felt that they had uh, too many people on duty at that time for the time we were in and they were releasing people for a reason 
uh, early. And my reason for requesting uh, early uh, separation was that I wanted to go back to college and get my life started again. It was a question of maybe two months. And um, they, they did allow me to uh, be separated early so that I could go back to school because summer school was getting ready to start. No, didn't have one. In, the, in those days, there was no GI Bill for the Cold War. They, in, they instituted that, I think, retroactively later. So where did you go to college? Well, I went back to summer school at UConn. And I didn't like what I was doing. And I transferred to the University of Hartford. So I, I graduated from there three years later. Uh, in what degree? Uh, I had a bachelor's in business. Okay. Um, what was your homecoming like? You know, I don't remember that it was anything special. I just kind of walked in the house and here I was. Okay. My parents didn't want me to go in in the first place. They weren't happy to see me leave. And when I came back, it was like I never left. So, it was nothing particularly memorable. Um, what did you do in the days and weeks following coming home? Went back to school. Right. I was in, yeah, I was in class and I studied all the time. Okay. Um, did you uh, keep any close friendships from your service? No. No, I, I don't remember ever hearing from any of the people that were uh, in the crew on my last ship. And um, uh, it didn't really bother me at all. I was, I was glad to get that in my rearview mirror. Right. Um, so what did you do for a career afterwards? Well, I started with a part-time job after school while I was at the University of Hartford, uh, working in the uh, data processing department at the Aetna Life. And um, when, when I graduated, I went to work for the Aetna. I just stayed with them and found another opportunity working and purchasing at Pratt & Whitney as a buyer trainee and uh, moved up from there and spent mo most of probably the next 24 years working in purchasing and made a career out of that as purchasing manager. your military experience influence your thinking about war or the military in general? Well, I was never in favor of war. That's no way to solve a problem. The, uh, the influences it had on me was uh, Vietnam was just getting started. I didn't approve of that war. Didn't like the films that I saw on TV of what was going on there. And didn't think we were in it to win it. And I just felt like uh, we shouldn't have been there. Okay. Uh, did you join any veterans organizations? I tried to, but I didn't. Uh, my uncle at the t uh, at that time, when I got out of the service, I tried to join the Jewish War Veterans. 
and he was post commander and said that I wasn't eligible because I wasn't a veteran of a war. So he said I, I couldn't join. I thought I had a friend. <laughs> but the uh, 50 years later, I, I did join. The rules had changed. And uh, I never joined other organizations that I don't know whether I would have been allowed to or not because I wasn't in a uh, hot war at that time when I was in. And the uh, uh, some I went to a meeting and bumped into somebody who asked me if I'd like to join the Jewish War Veterans. And I said, yeah, I've been trying for 50 years. And I, I was never allowed to. He said, well, the rules changed, and we'd like to have you join. And I did join. That was back in 98. And after that, uh, I became very active in the Jewish War Veterans and worked my way up uh, as post commander and then later as department commander. Uh, made a lot of friends, a lot of close friendships, a lot of good times. And it was like a band of brothers. Uh, since that time, I've joined uh, the veterans, uh, uh, disabled American vets. I do have uh, some disability from when I was on active duty and uh, belong to the uh, AM vets as well as the JWV. Well, I try to stay active, and uh, sometimes I wish I weren't as active. I'd like to have a little more free time. Yeah. Um, do you attend any reunions from your ship? No. I don't know. Well, I, I belong to the, uh, the U.S. LST Association, just to keep in touch to see what, what they're doing, but I have never seen an announcement of a... Uh, reunion for the ship I was on. Okay. And maybe nobody else wants to remember that ship either. Um, how did your service and experience affect your life? Well, it, it, socially it, it kept me very active with uh, the way I spend my time now because I'm, I'm very involved with veterans activities now more than I might have been had I not joined some of these organizations. But uh, that was more of a, a social thing, and uh, I'm very interested in the welfare of veterans. Uh, I belong to some organizations that are uh, uh, very pro-veteran, and uh, I'm involved with them quite a bit. I'm glad I am. Um, is there anything else that you would like to add that we haven't covered? Um, yeah. Um, if I had to add one more thing, it would be that I'm in favor of universal military training. So, uh, universal military training? Yeah, I, I think that everybody who is physically and mentally able should go through the service for two years so that they have a sense of what it is to be an American and uh, what it is to uh, n know more about who you are and what you're all about. Uh, I... I really strongly believe that everybody should have uh, a requirement to provide public service. 
and if it isn't if somebody isn't qualified physically or mentally for uh, uh, the military aspect of public service they could go into teaching they could do something that would require them to uh, pay back what was given to them through the sacrifices of other veterans many of whom didn't come back I would like to thank you for your service and for your time for this interview today. You're welcome.